Clippers of Pendell Memorial Post 436 and Langhorne Shelby Post 148 of the American Legion. Singing of our national anthem by Aaron Brinker and the invocation by Reverend Peter Hook, Veterans of Foreign Wars National Chaplain. Parade colors. Parade the colors. Our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave Proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the Thank you, Aaron. Bow with me at this time. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, this evening as we gather at this traveling wall, this national memorial, which lists the men and women who lost their lives defending freedom, and democracy for the people of South Vietnam. May they rest in peace and may light perpetual shine upon them. Continue to give grace to their families, their spouses, their children. As we come together to remember and honor those listed on the wall from Bucks County, we also pay tribute to those who served in Vietnam and survived. Their names are not listed on the wall. They returned home, many with deep wounds and scars, which never seemed to heal and vivid memories which are ever present. May their time here this evening and those that visit this weekend provide some solace. We're grateful for their dedication and commitment and the countless selfless acts these veterans perform to better our communities and protect the freedoms we enjoy. We invoke your blessing, O God, upon the program and the events that have been planned this evening. And may each of us as individuals and as a nation honor those who served and those who are serving and continue to be grateful to you, O God, for life, for liberty, and the freedom we have to pursue happiness. Amen.
Thank you, Reverend. Color guard, retreat. Please be seated. Good evening, and welcome all to this auspicious and solemn occasion where we will honor our 136 brave men of Bucks County who paid the ultimate sacrifice in the name of freedom and are inscribed on the wall behind me. A special welcome to those present that served and endured the hardships of the Vietnam War abroad and at home, and especially to our Gold Star families who bear the scars and burdens of the loss of loved ones. Marine Lieutenant and Vietnam veteran Cleve McClary impacted me greatly early in my service with his mantra, which states, in this world of give and take, there are not enough people who give what it takes. I'm retired Army Colonel Bruce Cordelli, a Bucks County native and the Chamonix graduate. And I'm honored and humbled to be your master of ceremonies this evening. I'm honored and humbled because I and those who carry the torch of service after these brave men and women owe a debt of gratitude to the veterans of the Vietnam War. They not only fought for our freedoms, they fought a negative public persona. They were not warmly welcomed home. Many received no welcome home or thank you. They received the exact opposite, as if they had done something wrong. Well, let me say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for forging the path for me and others. Thank you for never quitting, even though the conditions were unbearable. Thank you for doing your duty with honor and accomplishing the given mission. And thank you for giving what it takes. I and many of my comrades who led men and women in battle after the Vietnam War owe you that huge debt of gratitude. We were fortunate to have the backing of the nation, even though they may not have agreed with the war. The nation had learned albeit very late, but it had learned. Thank you will never be enough, but know that I and my comrades are forever grateful. So welcome to the twilight ceremony where we will honor our 136 brave men of Bucks County. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct privilege to introduce to you our first guest speaker, Mr. Alan McCabe. Alan is a National Park Service tour guide in Washington, D.C., and more importantly, a tour guide at the Vietnam Memorial Wall. His presentation at the wall is impressive and powerful, and tonight we are lucky to have Alan's, Alan speak. Alan, please come forward. Good evening. 
On behalf of the National Park Service and all of the volunteers who work at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., thank you so much for coming out this evening. And it is truly an honor for me to be able to speak here this evening in front of my 58,318 heroes on this wall behind me. My name is Alan McCabe, and I've been honored over the last 16 years to have spent nearly 9,000 hours in front of the wall in Washington, D.C. It, it's a labor of love for myself and all of the volunteers who work down there, and it's an honor to be here tonight with you as well. So I was asked to say a few words. I have a presentation that I put together over the years at the wall, and uh, it lasts about three hours, and they told me I have 12 minutes. So uh, I'm going to have to slightly divert from the original talk, but what I do want to talk to you about tonight is the reason that this wall is here. It is about healing. <laughs> I didn't do, oh, that's back, yay. The reason this wall is here tonight and the reason that that wall in Washington, D.C. exists, it's about healing. And I've heard it so many times, the founder of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., a Vietnam vet named Jan Scruggs, his documentary on him that was done a number of years ago is called To Heal a Nation. And we call it The Wall That Heals. And when you think about it, and I've had a lot of time to think about it standing in front of that wall, how in the world can a black granite wall heal anything? And years ago, you know, I had a, a woman that had come to the wall. She was looking for her cousin and her son was with her. He was about 15 years old. And I looked him up on the computer. I took her to where her cousin's name was, and, and she just broke down. And she was touching his name on the wall, and her son said, Mom, you're healed. Almost as if the wall was, had some medicine that was able to heal, to heal her. But it doesn't work that way. But yet through it all, in the 35 years that the wall has stood down there, it has healed a nation. It has healed the way that this country dealt with its Vietnam vets. For those of you in this audience too young to remember the Vietnam War, it tore this country apart. America's longest war, America's first televised war. The draft was taking hundreds of thousands of young men. The culture in America was changing. It was on the news night after night after night. The riots on the college campuses, the Kent State shootings. It was, a, it was a tough time, and this country blamed its veterans for the war. Vets came home ashamed to say they were a Vietnam vet. They, were, they wouldn't put that they were a Vietnam vet on their resume. This country was ill-prepared to deal with enormous, not just physical wounds, but the mental wounds, the post-traumatic stress disorder, the alcoholism, the drug addiction, the suicide. And now, years later, even dealing with the effects of exposure to the defoliants like Agent Orange that are, are known to cause cancer in so many of our veterans. And I've lost some wonderful friends uh, from cancer from exposure to Agent Orange. What a tough time that was. But that wall down there has helped to turn this country around. I believe it has literally changed this nation and the way that we treat our Vietnam vets. And I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the healing power of the wall and why it's healed. First of all, I want to talk about numbers. So we get about 5 million visitors a year at the wall, about 175 million visitors since the memorial opened. And I tell you, on some Saturday afternoons, it seems like all 175 million are there at the same time. And over the years, I have had hundreds of veterans come up to me and they say, is it always this packed down here? And sometimes I'll joke around with them and say, no, sometimes we get busy. But I know what they're thinking, and sometimes they'll even say it. I'll say, yeah, it's always this crowded down here. And sometimes you'll hear them say, maybe America didn't forget us after all. Because when they see the crowds 35 years later still coming down to that beautiful memorial in Washington, D.C., I know they feel that this country has not forgotten them. We weren't very good at it originally, 
but once that wall got built on the National Mall between Lincoln and Washington, and it has all these visitors, a vet can see that, that this nation has found and is remembering its Vietnam veterans. It's about the design itself. There's nothing else like it in the nation. A lot of controversy when it was built, a black underground memorial. People expected a general on horseback charging into battle with his sword drawn, and it's a very somber and quiet place. But to a Vietnam vet, I think there's a sense of pride that that's their memorial. And I hear vets say, it's my memorial. And it's so unique and so different and so powerful, and it's theirs. And they know that it was built before the Korean Memorial and before the World War II Memorial. So there's a sense of, of, of pride and a belonging there. And I think that has helped change our veterans themselves to feel the power of that memorial. The wall is a place to say goodbye. And, and I think that's so important. As human beings, when we lose a loved one, you need to be able to say goodbye. But this thing behind me, the helicopter, changed things in Vietnam. It took the wounded off the battlefield while the fight was still going on. I have talked to so many vets at the wall, they said I never got to say goodbye. I don't even know if he lived or not. He was pretty shot up when they put him on the, on the dust off. I don't know if he made it or not. And a squad in Vietnam of eight or 10 guys, those guys could have come from eight or 10 different states. The military in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, they, they recruited men from the same area. They probably went to school together. They, they enlisted together, they trained together, they served together, they fought together, they died together. And when they came back home, you could say goodbye to the guys you had served with at the local cemetery because they were all guys from your area. In Vietnam, the t eight or 10 guys in your squad, one could have been from Florida, one from California, from Oregon, Nebraska, from, from Pennsylvania, from New York and Vermont. And you probably only knew them by their nickname. And you were lucky if you even knew what state they were from. And so how do you say goodbye? You can't travel all around the country to find them. Instead, you come to the wall because no matter where they were from, their rank, their race, their religion, their color, they're there for you to say goodbye. The wall is a place of tributes. We see many tributes have been left back here at this wall. In Washington, D.C., over the 35 years the memorial's been there, more than 400,000 items have been left at the memorial. I have seen everything imaginable combat boots, flak jackets, helmets, dog tags, medals, POW bracelets, a wedding dress, Easter baskets, fishing rods, caps and gowns at graduation time, baseballs, basketballs, footballs, decks of cards, sea rations, everything imaginable. In 1995, a motorcycle club from Wisconsin built a Harley Davidson from scratch. They brought it down to the wall. Not one member of the club was ever allowed to sit on that bike. And they left it, they said, for any brother on the wall who wanted to come for a ride with them. They even got a special vanity plate from the state of Wisconsin. It's never been issued since. It just says, hero. That's just one of the 400,000 items. A couple of years ago, I went down to the wall. Early on a Saturday morning, I was the only one down there. And overnight, someone had left a cigar box. And I opened it up. And inside of that cigar box were nearly two dozen love letters that had been written from a soldier in Vietnam to his girlfriend back here in the States. He was killed in 1968. His name is on the western side of the wall, this side over here. And that woman had kept his love letters for 40 years, and on the 40th anniversary of his death, she brought his love letters back to him and placed them at the wall. I have no idea what caused her that day, that moment, to know that she had to let go. But she did, and the wall was the place that she came to to say goodbye. The wall is about being able to find your buddies. The wall is in chronological order by date of casualty. If I know when a guy served, I can get him back to his tour of duty. A couple of weeks ago, I had a guy at the wall. And his, he was with his wife. He was very hesitant to come up to me, but his wife came up and she said, can you help my husband find his buddy? And I said, yeah, we'll try. 
and he finally came up and he said his name was pineapple i said i can't find pineapple on the wall he said well that's all i knew him by what i said what else can you tell me he said well he was killed october 12 1968 and i said that's all i need and i found october 12 1968 on the wall and i said any any other thing about him he said yeah he had a hawaiian name and he was a marine lance corporal so we read through the names on that day and i finally found a name that looked like it was hawaiian and i looked him up in the computer he was a marine lance corporal and when i left him with his wife he was crying and he said i finally found my buddy i finally know who pineapple was and the wall has has that magical ability that closure for folks the wall is a place now for reunions just a couple of weeks ago the class of 1967 from west point had their 50th anniversary at the wall you didn't want to be a west point graduate in the class of 1967 that was the worst year since world war II to cut, be a young second lieutenant heading off to vietnam and they come down to the wall and i know where they're going to go because it's chronological and they'll come back in 1967 and 1968 to be with the guys they served with a couple of years ago i had a, a woman there and and she was looking up at the wall and i went up to her and i said can i help you find a name and she said no no i i know exactly where he's at it's my dad and but she said i'm here with my seven other dads and i said what what do you mean and she said well when my i never knew my dad but the seven other guys in his squad had gotten a hold of my mom they found her on the internet and since that time those seven men have treated me like their daughter they are the most wonderful men in the world i may have lost my dad in vietnam but I found seven fathers back home. And they were all there that day at the wall for their reunion to be with that woman. And that's part of the healing power of the wall. The wall is a place for a vet to go to and be with guys that served and saw what he saw. I can't imagine what a combat veteran can possibly describe to somebody who's never been in combat. And so at the wall, many of our volunteers are Vietnam vets. You're always going to find Vietnam vets at the wall. And you've got finally a place to talk to somebody who has seen what you have seen. A couple of years ago, a woman said to me, Alan, my husband never said a word about this war in 40 years. He comes to the wall. He meets some vets. I can't get him to shut up. He just needed to let it go. I can't imagine that building up inside of him all those years. But the wall was the place to meet other veterans that he had served with. I want to talk just for a second about wall magic, and then I'll, I'll wrap things up here. There's so many magical and amazing things that happened at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. There's even a book out on it called Wall Magic about the amazing coincidences that happen there, and they seem to happen all the time. Several years ago, one of our volunteers, a man named Charlie Hartunian from Massachusetts, was at the wall. He was a combat engineer in 1967, and he's standing where he usually stands right in front of the time period for 1967. And a guy comes up to him about the age of a Vietnam vet and says, can you help me find my friend? I was on his left side when he was shot and killed. He remembered the name, so they found it on the wall, and it was a tough 20 minutes for this guy in tears. It's the first time he'd been to the wall, the first time that he'd been able to say goodbye to his buddy that he lost all those years ago. The guy finally gets up to walk away. Charlie turns around to face the crowd. Another guy comes up, and he says, can you help me find my buddy? And Charlie says, yeah, that's what I'm here for. And the guy says, I was on his right-hand side the day he was killed. And Charlie says, what's his name? It's the same guy that the one on the left had just been looking for moments before. Can you imagine the odds of the coincidence of two men, one who was on his left and one who was on his right, both being at the wall, not only the same day, but the same hour, and finding the same volunteer 
And Charlie got those two guys together. They had not seen each other since Vietnam. And those type of amazing coincidences happen all the time. We just call it wall magic, and it's part of the healing at the beautiful and powerful Vietnam Veterans Memorial. I don't know who said this several years ago, but it's a powerful statement. Most walls keep people apart, but this wall has helped to bring a nation together. As I close today, I want to thank you for inviting me here to speak. I wish I had hours because the stories of that incredible place are just so amazing. I want to thank you all for coming out this evening and, and to all of our veterans in the audience. Those of you that at one point in your life raised your right hand and you swore that you would give everything, everything, up to and including your life for the safety and the security of not only this country, but other countries around the world, I have no idea in the world how America could ever possibly thank you enough. All we can do is try. Thank you for your service, for your patriotism, and for your love of country. And if you didn't get to hear it when you came home the first time, welcome home. And may God bless this country and all of our wonderful veterans. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Alan, for that wonderful presentation. Very impactful. St. Michael, the Archangel Catholic Church of Levittown Choir will now sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth.
Beautiful. Thank you so much. I would like to now introduce Mr. Dan Fraley, Director of Veterans Affairs of Bucks County. Dan is a U.S. Marine veteran who served in a combat engineer position in Vietnam from 1967 to 1968 along the DMZ. Dan's public service began when he was appointed by Governor Thornburg to the PA, to the Pennsylvania Agent Orange Commission. He is the chairman and founder of the Bucks County Vietnam War Memorial in Doylestown, dedicated to the 136 veterans from Bucks County inscribed on the wall. Dan also assisted in the construction and dedication of the Bucks County's Korean War Memorial, World War II Memorial, and the newest memorial, the Global War on Terrorism Memorial, all located on the south lawn of the courthouse in Doylestown. Additionally, Dan was responsible for starting the Veterans Transportation Program, opening veterans outpatient clinics, and the creation of the Washington Crossing National Cemetery. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Fraley. Thank you, Pete. It's extremely moving tonight to be here before you, Vietnam veterans, this wall behind us representing over 58,000 young men who were about 18 and 19 when we lost them. Not to mention the 136 young men from Bucks County. I've been doing this for a long time. And Ralph, you, you made a lot of points when you were up here, how serious and how problematic it is when people go to this wall, and you've seen a lot. I, I was almost losing it when you were talking. That's how things are. When we look at the greatest generation of this country, the World War II veterans, we know that there were 16 million of them. Now we're down to about eight, 18 or 800,000. The greatest generation is just about gone. But there's a generation of Korean War veterans after them. And of course now, our generation. I'm gonna call them tonight the great generation. And why are they the great generation? They are the great generation because they've earned that title. You know, when you came home and you pointed it out in your speech, how bad it was. Poor dead in Ohio and Kent State, there were people in unrest on college campuses. While our young students were going north to college, we were going south to Vietnam. We allowed the protesters at that time to dictate about our war and what we were facing. We allowed the politicians to send us to war and then remove their support and leave us there in a country 13,000 miles away. We allowed the media, and I remember myself listening to one night when we were leaving Vietnam through a truce, and I remember the well-represented Walter Cronkite at that time saying to America through via the TV set, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first war that we lost. I'll say it again, ladies and gentlemen, this is the first war that we lost. And I believed them. I actually believed them. I believed most of my adult life that it was a war that we lost. We allowed other people to tell us as Vietnam veterans that we lost the war. We were called losers. Many young men came home and felt that way. And you were right. Nobody said on the resume that they were in Vietnam. I didn't. But what happened was, over years, in my capacity, you heard some of my resume on the Agent Orange Commission and, and dealing with Vietnam veterans every day with leukemia, with uh, various stages of cancer. And I'll say this, when you look at the National Cemetery, this beautiful National Cemetery that we fought to get here in 
in Bucks County, you walk up and down the aisles of the headstones and you'll see all the Vietnam veterans buried up there. Many of them were buried and, and born five years after I was, or four years after I was. Now there's a reason for that. What's the reason? 19 million gallons of herbicide was sprayed in the country not much bigger than New Jersey. It was sprayed in its concentrated form. It was supposed to be diluted seven parts of water, being seven 55-gallon drums with one 55-gallon drum of herbicide. The chemical in the herbicide was dioxin. Dioxin will stay in your fat cells most of your life. That's the trigger, CDC. That's our government's health department, CDC, said that that's what's causing the death of all our young men who came back from Vietnam. I've seen them die early. I've seen them die in their 30s and 40s, and they're still dying. I was back here today, and I had a Vietnam veteran come up. He came up to me, and he had these diabetic socks on. He was on a cane, and he had three of the presumptive illnesses, three of the presumptive illnesses, and he didn't know that he could get help. And that's why I'm saying this tonight, because we can save people. The VA is ready to pay our young men. Now they're not young men anymore, they're my age, but we can help them. We have to get the word out. I'll say one other thing, and I think it's profound. I'm speaking from my heart, not my mind. Vietnam was a war that we won. I'll say it again, Vietnam was a war that we won. I don't care, and I'm not gonna let the media dictate what we did 50 years ago that we lost the war. I'm not gonna let some student tell me that he knew more than I did. I'm not going to let anybody change the direction, and I'm going to stand up for every one of these young men who were 18 and 19 and died before they should have. Before they went to a war where somebody said, you weren't supposed to be in that war, you made a mistake. Look at all the mothers and fathers that died. They're already gone. Look. And they made a mistake. We don't want that to happen to future generations. That's all I'm saying. We're at war right now. We are in a serious war overseas. And we need our politicians to stay with us. If you're gonna send them over, stay with us. Don't abandon them. That's all I'm saying. And I'll close by saying, we're gonna be back here all day tomorrow. So if you're a Vietnam veteran, you have a problem, you got a medical problem, come see us. We have free transportation to VA hospitals in Philadelphia and Coatesville. Come see us, we'll get you there. There's no reason why you can't get help. You get compensation and get free health care. And with that said, I'm gonna introduce a, a Vietnam veteran. John Rumsey, if you will come up here. On January 18, 1971, Corporal John Rumsey, in response to a sighting of Viet Cong, his patrol walked into an ambush. He was severely wounded by small arms fire. One of a grenade was thrown at him. And a fellow Marine, Tim Akers, better known as Bones, carried Corporal Ramsey to a medevac chopper and got him out of there. So it's my pleasure to introduce a Vietnam veteran, a combat wounded Vietnam veteran, John Ramsey. Vietnam veterans out here, so I can like kind of recognize them. If you're seated, can you please stand up? And if you're standing, just raise your hand so that we know where you are and who you are. Vietnam veterans, please stand up. Keep those hands up. Please remain standing and keep your hands up. Now, if you're near one of these great Vietnam veterans and you can reach out to them, if you want to give them a hug or simply reach out and say thank you for your service. God bless all of you. I love you all.
I wish I could come out there and shake all your hands. The Vietnam Wall stands as a symbol of America's honor and recognition of the men and women who served and sacrificed their lives in the Vietnam War. Inscribed on the black granite wall are the names of more than 58,000 men and women who gave their lives for our country. There are so many ways you could be connected to the wall. Your father, mother, son, daughter, brother, sister, relative, or maybe even just a high school friend. I would like to tell you about Captain James Carr, who was a career Marine who served in both Korea and Vietnam. He saw combat in Korea, but he emphasized he saw none in Vietnam. My nephew Michael had a family picnic before he got married and wanted the two families to get together to know each other. That's how I got to meet Captain Carr. As we were talking at the family picnic, I mentioned that I had been to the wall in DC and how emotional it was. He said he had to visit five Marines he called his boys. I knew I was confused since he did not see any combat in Vietnam. He then told me his story. As he was close to retirement, he was assigned the duty of going to a Marine's house and inform them of their son's death. He did this five times, thus his five boys. He went to a 19-year-old Lance Corporal's house in Brooklyn, New York to inform the family of their son's death. The mother answered the door, and Captain Carr can see in her face. She already knew why he was there. Captain Carr explained the circumstances about his death and said he would be there until after the funeral. He could have left at this point, but he stayed there, prayed, and cried with the family. A week after the funeral, he received a thank you card saying how dignified and professional he was in handling such a difficult task. At the end of the note was an invitation to their family reunion the following month. Captain Carr could have said he had other plans, but he said he would go. He met more of the family and he felt a bond growing between them. That bond kept growing to the point that for the next 12 years, he was invited to more family functions, weddings, milestone birthdays, more family reunions, and exchanged Christmas cards every year with the family. He had become part of that Lance Corporal's family. In 2014, Captain Carr's wife, Eileen, passed away. And two days later, heartbroken, Captain Carr passed away. I'm pretty sure that when he reached the gates of heaven, there was a 19-year-old Marine Lance Corporal and his mom waiting for Captain Carr to thank him for all the emotional support he gave to his family. Captain Carr was now united with his five Marines, or as he says, his boys. Captain's, Captain Carr's son, Brian, his wife, Melissa, and her daughter, Maddie, are with us tonight. To Captain Carr, I say, job, job well done, Captain Carr. Semper Fi, and rest in peace. Not everyone on this wall is a hero. I saw a poster of a combat patrol walking across rice paddy dikes in Vietnam, and at the top of it it said, I'm no hero. And at the bottom it said, but I did walk along some in Vietnam. Tonight we honor the 136 soldiers from Bucks County who gave their all in service for our country. I'd like to talk about two Langhorn veterans who paid the ultimate price. There is a street about five minutes from here named Brenwood Drive. There were only 16 homes in that street and two boys went to Vietnam and both were killed in action. The first was Marine Lance Corporal Harry Simmons who lost his life on April 8th, 1967. It has been 50 years since Harry was lost and he was the first Lower Bucks County soldier to die in Vietnam. Harry was carrying a wounded soldier to a medevac chopper when he was felled by a single enemy bullet. His sister Sandra is with us tonight. She describes Harry as a humble, strong, caring, gentle giant of a man with a heart of gold. He was a hard-working, kind, Langhorn young man. He joined the Marines to serve God and country, knowing that freedom comes with a price. 
It is paid for by the men and women that serve our country. Harry paid the ultimate sacrifice on April 8, 1967 in defense of his country. All gave some, some gave all. Rest in peace, Marine. Semper Fi, the few, the proud, the Marines. Hoorah! Thank you, Sandra, for sharing that with us. Sandra. The second Brentwood Drive veteran was Army Sergeant Terry McDonald, who was on his second tour of duty in Vietnam when he lost his life on April 10th, 1971. He was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his bravery. His citation reads, the Distinguished Service Cross is presented to Sergeant Ter Terrence McDonald, United States Army, for extraordinary heroism in connection with military operations involved with armed hostile forces in the Republic of Vietnam. While serving the 173rd Airborne Brigade, Sergeant McDonald distinguished himself by excep exceptional valorous action on April 10, 1971. On that day, he was serving as a medical airman for a six-man recon team, recon team on an offensive mission in Phi Mai District when the team was taken under fire by an estimated platoon-sized enemy force. The enemy initial contact included rockets, machine gun fire, and automatic small arms fire. In the initial hail of fire, the team leader was severely wounded, and the remainder of the team was halted a short difference away, leaving him in an open, vulnerable position. Sergeant McDonald, although wounded himself, realized what extreme danger his team, team leader was in, and with total disregard for his personal safety, exposed himself between the team leader and the enemy and began returning fire. An incoming rocket landed nearby, wounding him for a second time as the force of the explosion knocked him to the ground. He immediately recovered and rolled over on his team leader to protect him from the enemy fire. Realizing that no further movement was, that further movement was impossible, Sergeant McDonald stood up between the enemy and a severely wounded man and began placing accurate semi-automatic fire upon the enemy's position until he was mortally wounded by an enemy rocket. Sergeant McDonald's extraordinary heroism and devotion to duty at the cost of his life and in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the United States Army. Sergeant Terry McDonald is awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for bravery above and beyond the call of duty. Terry's sisters, Patty, Sue, and his brother, Tim, join us tonight. Thank you for coming. Two Langhorn heroes from that tiny Brentwood Drive. May they rest in peace. My ties to the wall are Rick Savio, Booby Trap, Dave Rudy, and Jack Perry, Friendly Fire, located on panel 7W. Thank you very much for listening tonight. And as gentlemen said, 46 years ago, I wouldn't admit I was a Vietnam vet. Today I stand here as one proud Vietnam veteran. Thank you. John, your sacrifice and the continued dedication to your brothers, family members, and community goes without notice, and we are very happy you are part of this community. Thank you so much. John is presenting plaques now to those family members, those Gold Star members.
now honor our 136 veterans of Bucks County by reading each of their names. As each name is read, an Eagle Scout from the Washington Crossing Council will light a candle along the wall in their honor. Please begin reading of names. Robert Lee Adams, Jr. Dennis Michael Adams. Mark Applebaum. Joseph Bradshaw Baggett. William James Barr. Carol Raymond Bauer. Warren Martin Beaumont. Edward Nelson Beers. Stephen Michael Bazinski. John Rodman Bloshishak. James Edward Borman. William Douglas Booth. William Warren Bryce Jr. James Francis Brennan Jr. Patrick John Breslin. Robert Raymond Brick. Donald Bruce Campbell. John Elton Candy. Edward Solis Canty. Jay Cecilia Jr. Robert Lee Sanford. Lee Fulton Flickner. Terrence Charles Connolly. Stanley Smith Pope Jr. Hobson Covington. Dennis Thomas Cudane. John Francis Alolo III. Philip Anthony Giannico Jr. Theodore H. Davis. Arthur Michael Day. David John Decker. Michael Francis Cini III. Lawrence Amelia. Victor Monroe DeWall. Theodore Lloyd Dougherty. Clay Edward Downey Jr. John Turner Dunlop III. That's fair. Donald Lyle Elliott. Hugh William Elmer. Glenn Harry English Jr. William James Hurst Jr. Carl Eugene Fell. Alan George Griffin. James Walter Guest. Donald William Powell. Jeffrey Lawrence Hand. George W. Hamilton Jr. Robert Post Hanson Jr. Joseph Henry Hanson III. William Harry Hayes. David William Harisco. Daniel A. Hennessy. Robert Warren Hill. Gary David Holland. David Herman Holland. George Raymond Hunstinger. William John Ivory. Gregory Germain. George Harry Johnson. Theodore K. Kalanichi Jr. Donald Richard Kremner. Frederick Robert Hutchinson. Paul Richard Lavolzi. Artist Carlos Lemire. Ronald Anthony Longfellow. David Charles Lone. Nelson Charles Luther. John Michael Lyons. Robert Howard Mag. Lee Edward Manning. James Paul Markey Jr. Frederick C. Marsh. Martin Terrence McDonald. William Herbert McDonald. Lawrence Thomas McDowell. Michael Bryan McGinnis. Frank Martin Mills.
Let our Vietnam vets hear us too. While the 
Standing ceremony here at Pendell Memorial Ball Field on PFC John DeLow Avenue. I will tell you again, as, as I was raised by the greatest generation, but trained by the Vietnam veterans, and I will tell you that I was so thankful to be trained by them. And I know my soldiers that I didn't lose one in battle in Iraq, injured but not lost, because of the Vietnam veterans. So I will tell you that I, again, I owe that debt of gratitude. I want to thank your speakers. Fantastic job. We appreciate it. <laughs> and all the participants of tonight's ceremony. But I need to give a special thanks to this patriotic community. I want to I want to applause for this community here because this is an amazing experience. This is where much healing, as Alan talked about, has already taken place and will still take place. Not a round of applause. But I want to especially thank Ed Preston. Ed won't take credit, but I will tell you, he is the brainchild. He is the person behind all this. And as many say, if you know him, he's ADD and OCD, but he gets it done. <laughs> so thank you, Ed. We also need to thank the committee. That I will tell you, the committee has done a super job, and there's, I'm not going to be able to name all, but I'm going to name some. Dale Walton, Vince Moscato, Lori Moscato, Dave Preston, Tom, and the rest. Round of applause. for that. This is an amazing event. As Alan said, 
where healing and closure can and already has taken place. I stated that many Vietnam veterans were not welcomed home. And Alan, I taught at Kent State after, after that time. And Sergeant Tolles, who was in Da Nang, in Hal Moore's battalion, came and talked talk to my cadets. And it was the first time he had ever spoken since 1965. And it was moving. And at that time, I couldn't wear anything but my dress greens. But healing had taken place there too, some years later. So I was able to help and thank Sergeant Tolles for his service and what he went through. So I welcomed him home and thanked him. And let me say that you Vietnam veterans gave what it took. And let me also say, welcome home. So may God bless our 136, all 58,318, and those that died as a result of their service in the Vietnam War. As greater love has no one to lay down one's life for one's friends. May God bless the Gold Star families. May God bless the veterans of Vietnam. And may God bless America. Reverend Hook, please lead us in a closing prayer. with me again. Our Heavenly Father, tonight we have reflected on the impact and significance of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall. We've also remembered 58,318 individuals, precious individuals listed on that wall. And we also remembered the 136 individuals from Bucks County. As a community and as individuals, as we reflected and remembered those individuals, we realize the cost and the effect, the effects of war. The effects of war fighting for those ideals that this country holds dear. Impress upon each one of us those values of our great country, which are in every American coin, that out of many individuals, we are one nation, and we are a free nation, and thank you for liberty, the liberty that we enjoy as a nation, and we are also a nation, oh God, that on our coin says, in God we trust. We thank you for those individuals that made the coming of this traveling war, wall to Pendel possible. And we thank you for this program this evening, which helped us reflect, remember, and also realize. May your blessing be upon this hallowed ground and also upon the individuals here as we separate and return to our homes, help each one of us to live lives that honor you. In your name, amen.
Thank you, Reverend Hogan. Will everyone please rise as the Joint Honor Guard conducts the 21 gun salute? They are going to shoot these guns. Be prepared. Followed by taps. Once taps has ended, the ceremony will be concluded. But please allow the Gold Star families time to honor their loved ones. Sergeant at Arms, take charge. Yeah. 